My name is Rebecca Krukoff, um, and I'd like to welcome you to the Fall 2020 Pratt Earth Action Week, Race Times Health Times Climate, and this particular panel, Preserving Activism Beyond and Between Pratt's Gates, Pratt's Black Student Union. We're so glad you could join us today. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Pratt Earth Action Week runs starting today, September 21st, through Saturday, September 26th, and there are many events to attend um, that can be found, my apologies, um, uh, that can be found all th throughout the week. Um, there's gonna be a link in the chat to this particular poster and you can register to attend. Um, all of these panels will be live in virtual events. And if you aren't able to attend the virtual event, they will also be made available through a recording. Um, in addition to these live events, there is a concurrent student exhibition available at the Pratt Sustainability Center's website, which is also right now being put into the chat. If you're interested in seeing that exhibition, please do um, do so. And it showcases Pratt student work from all of the schools and is a reflection of current and relevant issues surrounding sustainability and this week's theme, race times health times climate. Um, so we're very pleased again for you, that you are joining us for this particular presentation. Um, and before I begin with an overview, I would like to extend a special thank you to the provost office, who I know many of you are joining us today, and we actually would not be here without you, because it is through a provost-funded strategic initiative funding grant that we were able to do this work. And so we're very pleased to have you. In addition, I'm extremely pleased to welcome the Dean of the Architecture School, Harriet Harris, who is joining us and will, would like to make a few brief remarks. So thank you, Harriet. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I think this is such an important event and welcome everybody, not just to Pratt Institute, but to the School of Architecture, the Historic Preservation Program and the Art and Design Department who are your co-hosts for this afternoon. Um, as obviously Rebecca mentioned, I'm Harriet and I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture and I've been here a year and it's a different universe, I have to say, from London on so many levels. And what's been interesting actually is observing what's happened over the summer, seeing um, as a consequence of, of basically a police murder that we now have a revised and I would say renewed mandate from um, the Black Lives Matter movement to really look at ourselves collectively, individually, but especially as a school and question, are we really as equitable as we could be? Are we really championing DEI in the way that we could? And our institution has been doing a phenomenal amount of work on this, but we've been working intensively internally as well. And there's been an enormous emphasis, much like this panel today, which is convened of students as well as alumni, looking at working across, if you like, the generations, but also the, the partitions of professor and student and doing th things in a very collaborative and collective way. So I think, you know, why do these debates matter so much? I think at the moment we're seeing this need to really use the fuel that the summer has generated to power forward on fundamental changes that need to occur within all schools of architecture and indeed most universities. So there isn't necessarily a disciplinary subjectivity to change. It's one that we should all be embracing. Interestingly, in the School of Architecture, we've been looking at, very keenly at what our research specialisms are. And we situate heritage, conservation and preservation very much in what we define as the Future City Research Consortium. Because in our view, heritage is about the future of the city because the future of any city should only be diverse, fair and just. And by implication, its materiality, its forms and its spaces and icons should reflect that diversity of cultures and should be inclusive and easily accessible to all. So we're here, we're here really to hear about a very important part of um, the movements that took place historically at Pratt in relation to black activism and I suppose where I would position this is a kind of model exemplar of what we call archival activism. So what's archival activism? By definition this is a radical or counter hegemonic public history making activity that would otherwise risk being overlooked by the Caucasian scholars who have fashioned disciplinary history writing and, and uh, epistemological canons to reflect only their own image. So archival activism then is not some form of nostalgia driven antiquarianism, but it's a social movement which is allied to progressive and democratizing and anti-discrimination political agendas. So what we're here today are archival narratives that center heritage as activism. It's not history. It's not about disappearing off into a strip lit basement. It's very much about the configuration of the contemporary city and really situating this debate as something that is democratized 
confronts diversity and historical representation, but provides a methodology through the narratives we'll hear this afternoon for decolonizing the canon, decolonizing the curriculum, and offering us all a blueprint for collaboration and equitable partnerships that extend an invitation to all of you to become participants in what we're convening here today. So thank you all. If we want an equitable school, we need an equitable city, and we start with having an equitable discussion, and this is where it begins. Thank you all for attending. Thank you so thank much you. for those words, Dean Harris. And there's so much truth in, in what you're saying, and there's so many layers to this project that, you're, that you just described. Um, and we, we are so pleased that we are able to participate in this project, which is really the goal of which is to explore the relationships of the, of the of Pratt Institute to the social movements that have shaped it, both within the gates of the campus and outside of the campus within the community. And the overarching goal of this particular project is to foster research and public dialogue um, to highlight the voices of diversity, equity, and inclusion through an historical lens and to help amplify the stories of Pratt community that have been unheard or silenced over time. Um, the project manifests itself, oops, pardon me. The project manifests, shoot, apologies. <laughs> My apologies. My apologies. The project manifests itself in a variety of different ways um, through interdisciplinary courses that are taught across the campus through archival research as well. And it actually began um, in, the, in um, January of 2020 with a course called Between, Beyond and Between Pratt's Gates that was an interdisciplinary course taught between the Historic Preservation Program and the School of Art and Design. Um, and it had a variety of different components to it. There were several students that participated and did primary source research with the Pratt Institute archivist, Christina Fontanas, who you'll hear from in just a moment, um, and one of whom is on our panel, Anisha Carr. So to give you a little agenda of what we are doing today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our project. Then you'll hear from Pratt Institute archivist, Christina Fontanas, and Sarah Kanu, who are going to be discussing a current initiative that they're joining in, in terms of the archives. Then Professor Heather Lewis from the Art and Design Education Department will be providing a little bit of historical context for our panelists today. And then we're going to be welcoming um, Pratt alumni, Pat Cummings and Connie Harold, two students who were active on campus in the late 60s and early 70s in affiliation with the Black Student Union. And then we'll have time for a Q&A, um, which our students Anisha Carr and Sarah Kano will be facilitating. And we'd also like to hear from you. So I encourage you at any point in this presentation to please write any questions you have um, into the chat. And we will be monitoring your questions and be using them to guide discussion towards the end of the panel. Um, so in 2020, when we began the work, um, there were three students who participated in the course, and we studied several eras in Pratt's history. So I'm just going to give you an overview of a few things that we did as part of this larger project. So Anisha Kerr, who was on our panel, dug really deeply into the reform movements that began the Institute's history and dug into the archives of Charles Pratt himself and thought about why was it that Charles Pratt was moved to begin the school? How did he begin it? in relation to the progressive era, and who was he serving, and thinking about the working class men and women who attended the school at the very start, and who have began to shape the school in terms of its uh, foundation of industrial arts. Additionally, Michaela N. Zhu became fascinated by student activities through over the years, and did a lot of research in the early 1900s through the mid-century 1900s to compare the student activities that students are involved in currently to those of the past. And Caitlin Millen became fascinated by the era of activism in the late 60s and early 70s. And her project, What If the Students Are Right, 
looked at the activities of the Black Student Union at that time. And it was through that project that we were able to meet with Pat Cummings and Connie Harold, who shared their experiences and insights with us and who we're lucky to have today sharing those experiences with you. And so I'm going to pass this over to Christina Fontana, Pratt Institute's archivist, who will be talking a little bit about her work with this project and the archives currently. Let me just share my screen. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Cristina Fontanes and I'm the Institute Archivist here at Pratt. And I've been in this role for a little over a year now and collaborating with this project since last semester. So I'll be briefly discussing the archives role in preserving the Institute's history and how we've been working with researchers looking to fill in the silences and gaps of the historical record. And of course, I'll also, also show you some cool stuff from the archives. So a little bit about the archives. We are dedicated to preserving and contextualizing the institutional history of Pratt through our growing body of collections, which include, but are not limited to, the administrative records and publications of the institute departments, the school and programs, clubs, etc. Um, so like papers of Pratt family, faculty, alumni, ephemera, photographs, and audiovisual materials documenting the activities of the institute dating back from about 1849 to the present. And I also want to mention that our collections are available to Pratt faculty, staff, students, and external researchers as well. So as the Institute Archivist, my role is to curate, preserve, and provide access to our holdings. But it is also my duty to articulate a vision for the archives that, explore, that include exploring new ways to expand and outreach our collections, specifically with a priority of developing an institutional record that reflects diverse voices and experiences. And this part is key because archives are not just places where historical papers are housed and studied, but archives also represent a practice that frames that historical and social, and social analyses as instruments of action, whatever that action may look like. So in doing this work as archivists, we deal with the issue that archives have historically contributed to a feeling of otherness, right? Um, archives have cultivated a reputation of being spaces for quote unquote important research while also perpetuating social hierarchies that contribute to a narrow way of a narrow view of what is again quote unquote historically important. And also archives have long prioritized preservation over access and have prioritized the preservation of certain histories over others, mainly those of white cisgendered heterosexual men. And institutional archives bring with it all this baggage, but another issue is that they heavily document the administration and the faculty. And while this is important, these materials do not tell the full story. And our archives mandate does include collecting records by and about students, but what was highlighted through working on this project was that our institutional records and also in our, our whole archive structure is focused on Pratt's administration. So therefore we lack a history that is inclusive of all types of experiences at Pratt, whether positive or negative. So some of the ways that we've reframed the archives is by having policies and practices that prioritize access and transparency, and also by welcoming a participatory process into the archives where um, our researchers and our records creators are taken into account when we're doing appraisal, when we're describing the materials, and also when we're providing access to our records. And through this, we also kind of reach an understanding that records go through many rounds of interpretation, by the archivist and the archive staff and by the researchers. And these interpretations are not only valid, but they end up shaping the record and how it's subsequently interpreted and accessed by other researchers. So to talk about what this looks like in practice, I'll focus on one approach, which is amplifying student records that already exist in the archives by collaborating with the Pratt community through research and instruction, as was the case in this project. So Heather and Rebecca's class visited the archive um, as a group several times. And through, this, through these visits, the students in the class got a chance to see that they belong in the archives, both as researchers and as records creators. And in the meantime, they were learning about finding, accessing, and analyzing a variety of archival sources, and also discussing the impact of archival practice and history through hands-on archival research because while talking about gaps and silences is indispensable when looking to reshape the archives, 
this really shouldn't overshadow the records that already exist there. And each time an archives user, in this case, a student, accesses these records, we can see the collections is always evolving, meaning they become alive through countless uses and critical interpretations of them, whether by an independent researcher or in the classroom. And through the engagement with these records, we can see the evolution of student issues from Rice's intuition to the expansion of war in Southeast Asia. We see how the Black Student Union demands were different than those of other students. We see what were the demands of now closed schools and how they intersected with student organizations such as the School of Engineering and the Black Student Union in 1972. And these records also spark a conversation around the meaning of a student newspaper publishing a full issue denouncing their sponsoring institution. And we can also see what other materials were being published at Pratt, like the drum, a self-described radical publication by the Black Student Union in the 1970s that addressed issues of minority representation, racism, sexism um, within the institution and beyond. We can also see seemingly one-off publications that stemmed from student actions. These records also show solidarity and intersectionality, like the drum publishing a poem in support of Puerto Rico sovereignty, or the proposal of a Center for Black and Latin American Studies done in conjunction by Boricuas Unidos and the Black Student Union in 1972. But they also call out a lack of solidarity and intersectionality. And through them, we see who support the student struggles like faculty or workers unions. Grad student records also tell us about other universities and their student led actions. And they tell us about Pratt and its students relationship with their surrounding community. And in the meantime, they also tell us about other organizations that were involved in community activism, like the Pratt Area Community Council and the Educational Center for Peace. And these student records also give us some context, sorry, also give us some context into with which to examine, right? With which to examine institutional programs at Pratt that have radical roots like cooperative education and others that present a stark contrast to students' concerns and demands. But most importantly, these records narrate the lived experiences of Pratt students in their own words. And it's especially urgent that we reshift this fo the focus to the students because it's, it is their shared histories that not only the reflect the changes that are taking place within campus, but also in the larger society. And, and, so, and so provide insight into evolving issues, values, and belief systems. So to conclude, these records are a treasure trove of data on student-led activism that can be ignored, especially from the 60s and, and early 70s. But of course, there is a large time gap between then and now. And one of the ways that we're trying to stop this gap from getting larger is by collaborating with the current members of the Black Student Union and other student-led organizations such as the Latinx Student Alliance. So speaking of Students' lived experiences, I'll pass on the mic to Sarah Kanu, who is the current Black Student Union president and who has been working with the archives to document their organization's work. Thank you. Um, hello, I don't have a, a presentation, but I am uh, Sarah Kanu. I'm the uh, president of the Black Student Union. I'm going on my second year as president and I'm also the chair of equity and inclusion on Pratt student government. And uh, in both roles, my main goal and purpose has been to provide spaces and experiences for other Black students and underrepresented folks on our campus to be in community with each other and to, nav and to be with those who navigate the institution in similar ways. Um, my first year at Pratt, I noticed that there was an inconsistency or a confusion around what black run organizations were existing at the time, uh, going in and out of existence. And so this tension that I felt for the past three years is kind of one of the ways that inspired me to be present currently. Um, but it's also one of the reasons why I feel like working with the archives was such a big deal. Um, early this summer, we obviously saw a rise in um, not only COVID sending students home, and so students demanding 
lower tuition, they were been bored, a lot of ways that students were coming together, but also what happened in late May, early June, um, in regards to George Floyd and student government and the Black Student Union at the UW campus and the Black Student Union at our campus, getting together and forming demands and presenting them to the institution. And so this gap that exists, both that I felt in the past three years that I've been at Pratt, but also as Christina said, um, in regard to the information that has gone missing for a long period of time, um, is one of the reasons why I wanted to work with the archives. And it's kind of selfish because I'm starting with working with documenting the things that I've worked on for the past two years, but also trying to find the information for the people that were presidents the first two years I was at Pratt. And then um, if people have seen on the Black Student Union Instagram, also, I've also opened it up for people to send me stuff from when they were currently in the Black Student Union, whatever year that may be for them. So the whole point of it is to ensure that people don't feel like they're the first time the Black students have gathered on this campus or that they'll be the last time the Black students will gather on this campus, that they'll have somewhere to go to see like, oh, a couple of years ago, people were meeting, they were holding events and they were uh, gathering around a common cause. And so I would like to thank Christina for answering my email that I had sent at the beginning of this year to start this project with her, uh, along with everyone on this panel who's collectively you know, working for this effort. Uh, thank you. Sarah, thank you so much. We're so, so glad to jo you've joined us and so glad to hear about the work that you're doing with your, with the Black Student Union, but also in terms of collecting and sharing your own archives. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to actually ask now Heather Lewis, Professor Heather Lewis, to do a little bit of um, context and to help to introduce our guests from the Black Student Union. So Heather, I'm passing the mic to you. Hello, um, I have my video turned off um, and I am going to quickly follow up Christina's presentation of um, selective archival material um, uh, and show you some that is related to the talk that you're about to hear by Connie Harold, um, Pratt alumna 75 and Pat Cummings, um, Pratt alumna 73. And they will um, be touching on some of these, um, some of these archival sources. Um, and just to say that uh, they're here today because they participated in oral histories uh, this spring um, and during COVID. And so they, um, our students in the course interviewed them and we have continued the conversation since those oral histories. So it's a very iterative process. Um, and both of them are contributing not only their oral histories, but archival sources they themselves have, uh, memories, connections um, to other people in the past. So they're very much a key part of this ongoing project. So. Um, Christina did show you um, some selective materials, but I'm focusing here on um, the 70s, um, the, and Pat will talk about the late 60s as well. Um, Connie will talk about the 70s, but this is um, focused on um, an action and demands by the Black Student Union. And the reason I'm showing you these quickly is uh, to make the connections to the present. Um, so one of the demands, or a list of demands, was for representation um, in faculty, administration, um, up to the Board of Trustees. Um, another demand, um, number four here, was for a Black and Lat Latin American Studies Department um, uh, and a program of Black Studies, which um, those of you who are at Pratt now know that we, we don't have that. Um, and the, um, just the final one I wanted to point out was a, the development of a summer program utilizing Pratt's campus for uh, youth in the community. And Connie will be talking about that. And I'm just going to share a few images um, about that program, which um, began in 72, but went on um, for a number of summers. Um, and Christina showed you uh, Drum, uh, the magazine of the Black Student Union, and Connie illustrated um, this particular cover. 
and this one. Um, and um, this is just a, um, an example of a gallery show sponsored by the Black Student Unions. And just very quickly wanted to share just two demands from the BSU today um, that were mentioned earlier. Um, so this one has to do, again, similar to the past, about the content of the curriculum and the need to change it um, and to create Black Studies, which, sorry. Um, and the second one is um, to re for Pratt to renew its commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, including um, hiring more faculty, um, more non-white faculty. So as you can see, there's echoes, very clear echoes, and this, these are only just examples of um, from the past um, to the present. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Connie and to Pat, um, each of whom I've just asked for them to briefly share some of their um, history. So let me just quickly introduce Connie first. Um, and as you know, um, just I just want to stop my screen share. Just one minute. Okay. Um, Connie, um, Connie came to Pratt um, and the oral histories are very detailed and fascinating and they will reside in the Pratt Library, the transcripts as well as the history. And you can access that. Um, you're getting a very mini condensed, condensed version today without all the amazing descriptions of what their experiences li were like from the very beginning. Um, so uh, just to summarize some of that for you, Connie, um, Connie started at Pratt, but she had a background as she was growing up in New York of attending the equivalent of, of um, excuse me? In Detroit. I grew up in Detroit. Sorry, what did I say? Sorry about that. I grew in up Detroit. in Detroit. <clears throat> yeah. You and had the, sorry. And um, had um, a similar experience to students now currently attending Pratt Saturday Art School. Uh, she started from the time she was seven um, up until high school, and then in high school went to a very prestigious magnet school where she could major in art. And that school um, at the time offered scholarships to two students um, uh, to come to Pratt, full scholarships, um, which she obtained. And she then became an activist at, at Pratt. So I've just summarized a, a very, quickly, um, a lot of history there. Uh, so I have a couple of questions for Connie and, and I'll just put them all out here. Um, could you talk a bit about becoming a student activist at, and, and be joining the BSU at Pratt and about the other students who were involved because we don't yet have um, their stories um, and some of the other the leaders. Um, and uh, if you could talk briefly about the strike, which I mentioned in 1972 and um, what that was like. So um, I think those are some of the questions. If, if you could address those, Connie. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> Tell me if I'm speaking loudly enough. I have a little difficulty with, with that. Um, I, became an, I became a student activist actually in high school involved in the uh, anti-war movement. But when I, so when I came to Pratt, I was, you know, the times were such that students were on the move across not just the country, but the world. Uh, and I did not get involved with the BSU until I think April of 72, after I had decided that I was not going to go back to Detroit ever for lots of reasons, both uh, personal and because of the environment. And I was looking for a way of connecting in Brooklyn, in New York, um, on campus and things like that. And Gail Harris um, introduced me to the Black Students Union. And at the time, this was before they were talking about strike, they were talking about, you know, getting 
um, more black teachers, that sort of thing. And when uh, people actually started talking about the strike, I brought up the possibility of having the summer program based on my experiences, you know, having professional artists be your, your teacher and getting the respect as a, as a very young person as an artist. And, it, and so as it uh, progressed, let's see, Vicki Golson, who Pat knows all these people, Vicki Golson was one of the main leaders. She was very political. She went to the National Black Com Convention in Gary, Indiana, where Shirley Chisholm was, you know, beginning her run for president. There was Angel Rivera, who was a veteran and was in the engineering school. Um, Gail Harris, um, she was from DC. Her mother was the uh, executive assistant to Walter Washington, who became the mayor of DC, the first black mayor of DC. Um, uh, Claudine Brown, I just remember Claudine, um, she was, she became the, um, the person in charge of the African American Museum Project for the Smithsonian Institution later that eventually became the African American Museum. These were very dynamic people. And um, so they were all seniors and I was a freshman. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't talk about how we got to a strike that well because I wasn't there in that part of it. But once it started, once the whole movement for it started, I remember Claudine uh, saying to people, she, she wasn't in support of it because she thought it would adversely affect people's careers. But other people wanted to go ahead and do it and it happened. And um, the takeover of the building, the original takeover was the building at the corner of Willoughby Avenue and Hall Street which was not one that students usually went in. And I was there for uh, two days and one night. Um, and it was obvious that it had not been well planned because we didn't have any food. We didn't have all of those sorts of things. But once we were there, those of us who were considering leaving, the doors were um, locked. Somebody had taken change and locked chains and locked them. So we were there that night, regardless, and you know, talk through what we wanted to do. And the big thing, at least for me and a few other people, was for things not to become violent, not to you know do something stupid. Uh, so the police would come on campus, and also if you do that, then nobody's going to listen to what you have to say. So um, the demands were written up and handed to the administration and things like that. And um, then the, the general strike happened after that, a couple of days later, and uh, they had a list of demands and the faculty supported us, all of us. And um, it was in the New York Times. It became a big deal. I mean, you know, art students don't usually hit the ramparts. Um, so um, because I had been involved with some of the discussions and had wanted to promote the summer program, I was asked to sit in on the negotiations with um, Jerry Pratt, the great grandson of the founder and uh, the members of the board of trustees who um, were meeting with us. And my whole point about the summer program was that, you know, for oftentimes young people, children don't have opportunities to see what's possible. You, you know, you grow up in a particular environment with particular family. And if you're a creative person, by the time you hit high school, you may have had all of that knocked out of you if your environment is not supportive. And so I wanted to 
um, take that high the idea that everybody was talking about about having more interaction with the neighborhoods with the communities and uh, take what was specific to Pratt you know the art and the architecture and the engineering and all that and give these young people the opportunity to explore that and it also it would give uh, students the opportunity to have jobs in the summer and there'd be some of uh, the professors would do that, and that we could all learn from each other. Um, you saw that, and it says here, Pratt Institute is a repository stockpiled with the artistic and educational facilities. The Brooklyn campus is crammed with art studios and sprinkled with dark rooms and engineering labs, tennis and basketball courts dot the college camp community. There's even a kitchen sink here and there. The, as the atmosphere is one of self-discovery and doing your own thing. Um, the, uh, it was called the Summer Pratt Institute Summer Skills Discovery and Development Project. I don't know who came up with that title, but that's what it was. And it, in, it included, as I said, painting and drawing and, and some architecture, some engineering. And also, after the first year, when I talked to Horace, who was a community liaison, and, and the funders wanted to um, help with get the kids to write more and stuff like that, it started to include writing and um, I don't know how well you can see this. I'm going to read this little poem here that one of the children did. The ballerina, there was something dancing on the tower and I looked and behold, it was a flower. It danced with such grace. It looked like it had been taught by someone with a steady pace. The flower ran down the tower stairs and danced on the trees pears. That's by Dwayne Pass. There's another one about running track, things like that. Um, there was photography, all kinds of, of, of things. And, you know, the kids blossom. And I know from my own experience that if you have success in one area, that then that carries over into other things that you do. We see that all the time with athletics where kids get a million opportunities to develop their skills, but creative children often do not. So anyway, one of the um, other demands was for a community liaison, which um, I'm not sure how that had grown out of that, but uh, myself, Gail Harris, and Angel Rivera sat down and wrote uh, the proposal for the, the summer program and for the community liaison. Because after we had said it this, uh, with um, Jerry Pratt and the board of trustee members, they said, okay, well, we agree to this, you know, these things, now write it up, write, write a proposal up. And we're like, oh my goodness, it's Thursday and we're supposed to have something Tuesday. So we sat down and we did that. And um, the main f focus was someone who was, who would be able to bridge the gap between the campus, the administration, the students and the different neighborhoods and communities because all urban campuses, not, it's not just Pratt, all urban campuses have that difficulty. You know, this is the elite institution and this is the neighborhood. So um, we wrote up the job description and it was refined by the administration and, and we had um, people applied for it and all of that. And Horace Williams was um, selected. He, had, he was a graduate of Pratt and he had deep ties in the Brooklyn community. He was originally from South Carolina, but um, 
he had played on the basketball team and all of that. And he had a good idea of what we were trying to accomplish. So between Horace and I, we pushed for the summer program. He, he got money. Pratt was putting money in it, but he got other money. And, um, and he was the one who kept it going, you know, after that. You have to have somebody in the institution who can do that um, and expanded it. Um, now I forgot. And he was the first, Horace became the first African-American vice president at Pratt. He, he did his whole career there. He, um, so it was a great choice overall. The rest of the strike, the one thing I'll say about um, uh, strikes and those kinds of actions is that after you've made your demands, and after you have gotten someone's attention, there has to be follow through. And since the majority of the people who were in our strike were seniors, there was only a couple of us still around to do the work. Gail happened to still be around that summer and Vicki was, but Angel was a um, junior, I was a freshman. And if we had not, taken upon ourselves to uh, follow up, nothing would have happened. And that's always a problem. You know, students are gone after a couple of years. So the it's always important to me to try to connect with the, the institution itself to, to get that support so that there is a continuation with what you're trying to do. Um, Connie, I just wanted to say we've got about another minute or two, um, okay. and I know um, you wanted to um, perhaps say something about the current um, oh, yeah. um, student demands. Yeah, looking at those uh, demands, I'm so struck at how similar some of those issues were. I did have a couple, two quick suggestions. Uh, the whole thing with the police, I kind of agree with that. You don't really want police on campus. And I, my suggestion is to contact someplace like the New York Peace Institute and get an outside group to help mediate on those issues because that's a very emotional kind of thing. And it doesn't have to be that particular thing, but um, to deal with whatever the underlying issue is. If you want to create a black studies department or whatever, you might start with the Studio Museum in Harlem and talk to them. They had a great um, exhibit called To Conserve a Legacy, African-American African art from historically, no, American art from historically black colleges and universities. Um, that was also with uh, Princeton University. Now, Princeton University has an alliance with the HBCUs and get some idea of what it could be because a black studies program for an art school is gonna be different than it is for Columbia University. And I think that in crafting it, you try to look at, again, the strengths of Pratt and you can get possibly funding from Mellon Foundation or Ford Foundation and National Endowment for the Humanities. But my, my point is just that somebody's got to follow through. It's not enough to demand. It's not enough to say, you know, the, things are wrong, things are wrong. It, you, have to, you have to promote solutions. And it's not that people in an administration or an institution don't want to do that. They may not know where, where to start. It's not what their job has been up to then. And if you can come up with some creative ideas, at least it gives you a point of, to begin the conversation. Um, and that anything's possible, you know, look around you. 
everything started out as an idea in somebody's mind you know, in a creative community anything is possible use that creativity to create the kind of world you want to have well, thank you so much, Connie. I'm sorry, we have to move on, no, but fine. really thank you so much. Um, and you certainly, I hope at the end of this, um, we'll be able to hear more from you. And I'm going to quickly introduce Pat in the same way I introduced Connie by briefly summarizing the background that she shared with us in her oral history. Um, and if I get anything wrong, just correct me, Pat. Okay. But um, Pat moved, ar moved around on military bases um, as a child, both in nationally and internationally, um, and came to Pratt with that broad experience, but she also said it was a protected, somewhat protected life. And she was coming to New York City from that. Um, and started out uh, wanting to major in fashion, but um, during her first year switched to illustration. Um, and then right after making that choice, she said the revolution started, this is a direct quote, and you <laughs> dropped out because you were quote, going to become a revolutionary. Wasn't I thought the world was going to change. <laughs> I really did. <didn't. laughs> and so, um, and then, uh, she transferred out of Pratt, went to a few, some other schools, and then came back as a junior. Um, and things had changed somewhat um, when she came back. Um, but she's going to describe what those experiences were like, both at the beginning and then when she came back as a junior. Thank you. Right. Okay, yes. Um, I came back and met Connie, because when I came back, it was a whole other phase going on. And the point that she made, I thought was really excellent, is there has to be continuity if you want anything to get done. If there had been Black and Latino faculty, perhaps some faculty member could have been the one to carry the ball forward. Do you know what I mean? You need somebody on campus who's going to actually make sure things keep moving along because students come and go. That's just the nature of it. But yes, I came to Pratt in 1968 and completely, completely unprepared for anything like it. Um, my father had said New York eats 18 year old girls and I thought cool because um, I've been living on military bases so <laughs> I didn't have a clue. And he dropped me off um, at the dorms on Willoughby and asked me if I needed anything and I was like no, 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 go, 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 I'm fine. And within about Oh, I'd say half an hour, I'd wandered away from the dorms and I was completely lost. And it took me two hours to get my way back from maybe Lafayette and Clinton to get back to the dorms. Um, I was completely lost. And, but it was very exciting. It was very exciting. So I was on campus and that's when I met Horace Williams. And he's the one who introduced me to the uh, Black Student Union. And it was, 68 was a volatile, volatile year. It's quite similar, I think, in tone to what's going on now. You know, people were um, engaged and enraged about the Vietnam War. Things were going on. Um, Martin Luther King had been assassinated. Mm -hmm. That was the year that Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. There was a lot of turmoil. And what I caught was this feeling of um, involvement that you can actually get involved and do something to change the way things are, that you don't have to tolerate it. The um, SDS was very active on campus, the Student Democratic mm -hmm. Society, very active, and we'd go to their meetings and everything. And when the Black Student Union um, came together, <clears throat> we did have a, our list of demands that we wanted to change. And we realized after some time that nothing was going to happen, that we were just asking and you know demanding and not a lot was happening and we had our own version of a it wasn't really a strike we thought we had to do something dramatic in order to be um, taken seriously so what we had done was we locked down the campus we had decided that if we were not going to be heard nobody was having classes nothing was happening until somebody talked to us about getting black and latino studies getting more um, professors getting representation in the administration in the employees, whatever. <clears throat> and so we had actually locked down the campus. And when I look back on it, of course, it was very naive. I mean, we literally went around and just chained up different fences, you know, so that nobody could get <laughs> on campus or get off. And it was just, it was, 
it was thin. I mean, but, but we felt we were doing what we needed to do and that this was going to be effective. And I remember that I was on patrol walking past the gate over there on Hall Street um, and, you know, checking to make sure that all the locks were secure and everything. And I found one of the janitors trying to burn the lock off with a pocket watch, a pocket uh, lighter, you know, and I was like, what are you doing? We're having a revolution. And he said, you know, I've got to get my trash cans out. And I was like, not today, <laughs> not today. you know, we're, we're, we're locking it down. But the police came and there was a lot of excitement and people got arrested. You know, I was watching friends get swacked with, you know, billy clubs and stuff like that. And Horace Williams was in there defending, defending students. And it was quite exciting and gallant. And I remember my father coming up and saying, this is not the real world. <clears throat> this is school. And you don't need to do anything that, you know, is going to have some lasting implications or like a police record or something like that. He was concerned about these long reaching effects. And I was concerned about changing the world. And yes, I wanted long reaching effects, you know? So, um, but we, like Connie, when they had their strike, we didn't want violence. We didn't want anybody to get hurt. We just wanted to make our point and we wanted to get heard. And so we worked together and it was that kind of um, engagement, particularly coming from, like I said, a very isolated background, working with others that was so exciting. What I found and what I encouraged the current Black Student Union to do if they're not doing <clears throat> is to get in touch with the Black Student Unions at the other schools in the city. You know, we were in touch with Columbia and NYU and City University and all those Black Student Unions so that we could share ideas about, well, how did you get this done? How did you get that done? And beyond that, you know, for the purposes of our <clears throat> our gatherings, if we wanted more people on campus, because there were not that many Black students on campus, they would come over and they would join us. So it wouldn't, you wouldn't really know who was a Pratt student and who, would, who wasn't, but it looked like more, you know, a show of power. Um, but when we had our meeting, you know, with the president and sat down, we had our list of our unnegotiable demands. You know, we had our unnegotiable demands. And when we sat down and he said, okay, let's talk about number one first. You know, let's negotiate number one first. And everybody was like, okay, let's talk about that one. And I thought, but this is unnegotiable. <laughs> you know that part where we're not supposed to, you know. <laughs> but of course it was negotiable. Um, and the thing that got me was, aside from this fabulous feeling of being part of something where you really felt you could change something, um, and we, we were doing things. We were bringing kids on campus. It, but it was like, you realize, and like Connie was saying, you have to actually do the work. And we were doing the exciting, fun parts. We would get kids and we'd bring them into the pie shop and we'd saw that they got food that day. And, you know, it, it's not long-term solution. And when we were sitting in the meeting and, and he's listening to our demands and we felt something is going to happen now, what happened was what happened after I left. Because I was only there for a year because I was off to join the revolution. Um, which went, <laughs> you know, did not exactly turn out the way and I said. And here we are. <laughs> and, yet, and yet here we are. And yet here we are. That the revolution uh, for me took place in Belmont, Massachusetts. Not exactly, <laughs> you know, not exactly a, a hotbed of activity. But um, when we actually did get some progress, the, um, the administration is very wise. I mean, they know what they're doing and they threw some money at the Black Student Union to, to write up these proposals and stuff. And Connie came in around that point when they were developing these proposals. But the minute they did that, it kind of like, you know, calmed everything down and everybody kind of went to their corners and thought, ooh, what are we gonna do with the money? You know, <laughs> and a proposal had to be written. And this is where the follow through becomes so important. Um, and what I urge you, Sarah, to, you know, to take back to the BSU is that to have a plan, to have a platform, there has to be that work. And that's why I think it would be that really good to have a faculty member or somebody who's carrying it through, you know, from year to year so that it, there's some continuity with it. Um, because the fact that things have not changed that much since the time that we were all there is telling in a very bad way that things have not changed. And I thought what Dean Harris was saying about the tie, which she was talking about before, about the tie between architecture and art and things like that. It's really interesting because when I think about it at the time, architecture was a big part of it. This was, this was an ivory tower situation in the middle of a black community, basically, ignoring the community like it wasn't there. It, it had blinders on. 
And the students, as black people, we saw that. We saw that, you know, you know, do you, have you looked around? Have you seen where you are? And when Connie brought in that program about bringing kids onto campus, that was part of it, like trying to reach out and include the neighborhood and not treat it as like uh, worth some fortress, you know, surrounded by a hostile, you know, population. Include them, include them. And so but, uh, the way that we did it was, uh, you know, looking back, like I said, it was juvenile. It was like we just grab kids and bring them onto campus, make sure that they had lunch. That's not a long-term solution, you know? So writing up programs, getting funding for programs and implementing them, bringing on faculty, bringing on administrative staff and at the higher levels, that's what's going to make the difference. And my memory is really cloudy. You know, but I, but I mean, really, really cloudy. But um, of what I do remember, yeah, Horace Williams was a big actress. Errol Crawford, Aaron Bell. Right, Errol. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There were a lot of people who were, who were very involved. And everybody had that energy, had that desire, and had the smarts to start putting things down on paper. It was just a question of, you're not around. And like my father said, you know you're going to be moving on to something else. You know, you're going to be moving on. So you're not going to be around to see these programs implemented. When I came back to Pratt and Connie was there, it, I came back to the aftermath, you know, after the fire in that building and after the proposal had been written. And, and, and things hadn't really changed. It really hadn't changed much as a result of it. And I thought the money had almost neutralized the effort because it seemed like just getting that proposal together had, had exhausted everybody and, and spent everything. You know, and it just didn't seem to um, have the lasting effect that we had hoped it would have. What I see now, the times they are now, I'm only hoping, I'm only hoping that students have the level of energy and feeling of wanting to commit to change that we had then. Because the, um, my concern is apathy, is that what, that's what I fear. Because after I come to Pratt, <clears throat> um, a couple of years later, Kent State happened, where students were killed on campus. And it was so volatile and so harsh. And everybody cared so deeply. But when I came back and started teaching at Pratt, I remember talking to um, uh, a friend that I, uh, a friend of a friend that I had met who was teaching on Kent State's campus. And he said students didn't even know what had happened there. And those were students, and it was, what is this, 30 years later, who didn't know anything about the history of Kent State, about what had happened, and that weren't, weren't concerned. Their concerns were things like, you know, getting a car, getting an appointment at the tanning salon. <laughs> and I was like, what, what, what? <laughs> so apathy is what worries me now. And to the extent that Sarah U and the BSU or other student organizations can make sure that that spark ignites something, do you know what I mean? Actually leads to more change. Congratulations and you know, hurrah. And I would like to just say as one member of the faculty of people of color, I would be really supportive of anything you did. You know, any kind of action that you took. That's my guess. Thank you so much, Pat. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And Rebecca, you're taking it from here, correct? That is correct. And actually what we're going to have time for now is a question and answer period. So um, I saw that some people began to type questions into the, the chat, which is great. And I encourage all of you to do that. And while you're doing that, I'm hoping that Sarah and Anisha, who Sarah, as you met before, is the president of the BSU and Anisha Carr, who's a current graduate student in the Historic Preservation Program, will kick us off with a couple of questions while the audience is typing questions into the chat. And then we'll move on from there. And Connie and Pat, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I know that there's so much more that you can tell us. And so I'm hoping that people write their questions into the chat and we can hear more from you. So Sarah or Anita, either of you can start if you have questions. Um, I guess going off what you just said, Pat, I actually had a question that was similar to that. And also um, the apathy is a huge thing. Um, on student government last year, that was something that we talked about with each other frequently is that students often have complaints 
and they have a lot of things to say about Pratt, but when it comes time to joining us to get those demands met, that doesn't happen. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think my biggest fear is that I've run into apathy as well. I mean, I'm the only one that runs the Black Student Union for the past two years. So it's this idea of maybe students don't need this as much as I think that they do, or at least that I feel that I need it. Um, so that's very valid. I actually had a question that was related to that. And I was gonna talk about that as your current faculty member, do you see the same like energy or presence of students wanting to rewrite the way we exist in society now? Or is it more so that they're focused on, or maybe there's a desire to just graduate and get a job in like a production aid based industry, especially like being a communication design. So much of what we do is serving um, others. And so do you feel like there's maybe less questioning of our role in society? I do. <clears throat> and I feel like it's sort of tragic, but also sort of unavoidable because every generation tries to make it easier for the next generation. And what I fear is that, and I've been seeing this for many years, is that a lot of the students that I run into have had things taken care of for them, you know, mm -hmm. um, have had things covered. So they don't have this sense of, I have to get up and do this. I have to make the change. Um, if somebody else is going to do it. Somebody else is going to take care of that. Um, that's, a fear and I, I don't know that how we get around that because that's the whole point not the whole point but that's the whole thrust of society is to make it easier for the next generation so they don't have to do certain things over and over again so it's not the fault I don't think of the students that I'm seeing but if you don't feel a pressing need you can't just invent that mm -hmm. that desire to change something that you don't really feel if you ain't worried about, you know, paying your rent, you know, mom or dad's going to take care of that. It's hard to, um, to say, take a look around the world and take a look at everybody else. If you start programs that have outreach and make people get to know people who don't have what they have, you know, mm -hmm. so the outreach programs, like what Connie was talking about, bringing in kids, taking a look at the kids, what they're writing and what they're drawing, you know, and seeing kids who have less privilege than a lot of the kids on campus, a lot of the students on campus, then you start to see somebody else's life becomes very vivid, very real to you, and the stakes go up. And you realize it's not just about your back is covered. You know, so I think it's a it's more it's it's more of a challenge now because the your peers that you're working with are probably not in a situation like the majority of the planet is. They don't have to feel that. They don't have to feel threatened by things, you know. And you and you don't want to you don't want to create threat, but you do want to expose people to what realities are. And it's sometimes I think very easy not to see reality when you surround yourself with like, you know, like situations, people who are living like you live. So I think that community outreach thing is a huge part of like sensitizing. Um, your peer group. Thank you. Mm. Nisha, do you have a question that you'd like to ask? Um, yeah, I had a question uh, for Connie. Um, I want to know how your career progressed after you graduate, graduated from Pratt and how your work at BSU, if it did affect your progress, how that happened. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't graduate from Pratt, I left. And um, it was because I had some, I have multiple sclerosis and it was undiagnosed at the time. And I, I was going blind <clears throat> amongst other things. But, um, and I went on to Columbia University. But <clears throat> that, that um, illustration in the drum, the one of Angela Davis, I used that in my portfolio and I got my first freelance job at Encore Magazine through that. And the reason I started doing publishing um, publications was because after doing the, the cover of the drum and the um, other illustration, I realized I could do that. I was interested in, in magazines and that if I was gonna do all that much work, I was gonna get paid for it. I was one of those people who needed <laughs> to have some kind of job. So, you know, there was a direct outgrowth from that. I did uh, three of the brochures for the summer program, designed them, and um, 
use those in my portfolio. Uh, and in fact, I got the, the first one I did is because I had seen this one and thought that it was ugly and said I could do better. And they said, oh, well, here, you could do better, you do it. <laughs> so, but um, I will say that I, be, I became a writer, eventually playwright. I'm a novelist now and I writing, did marketing writing and, and things like that. Um, became an administrator, much to my chagrin. But that particular period at Pratt, the things that I learned, not just in terms of arts, but but um, I learned that the, the things that I knew from art, the elements of art, the techniques, all of the perception, all of that was applicable to any other situation. That if, if there was a problem, I could find a solution going through the same process and using that same creative ability. And that you can be creative in innumerable ways that are not just artistic, but that, so I, I don't say it much, but I tried to make my life my art more than just writing or drawing or doing it that way, that, that approach makes it all an adventure and that approach elevates whatever you're doing. And I have to thank Pratt for that. I can say terrible things about it in other ways, but I will thank it for that. <laughs> so we have, a, we have a question from the chat, and I think that more than one person on the panel could answer this question. And it says, I appreciate that Pat mentions the concern for apathy. Could what you, be, what you are describing also be considered as an ahistoricism or ahistorical thinking? That's the first part of the question. And the second is, do you think that more access to the archives would challenge this method of thinking? So anyone that, that anyone can answer that. It could be our Connie or Pat or Heather, or, uh, Christina. Having the archives is gonna help, I think a great deal. Um, but you know, we're, Pratt is not, an isolation. It, the whole, our whole society for quite a long time has forgotten that we're all in this together. And, it, and that has been promoted. And what we're seeing is a, a fundamental shift back, I think, to saying, you know, just because I have mine is not enough. And um, the participation is it. I think you just have to be creative in how people participate. You yeah, know. definitely that. And I think when we talk about access to the archives, at this point, the Pratt Institute Archives is um, open access, right? If anybody can come in, we don't, and we have written policies around <laughs> that. We don't ask for university credentials or anything like that. And everybody is given the same treatment, whether you're looking into your great grandmother that went to Pratt and you're just feeling curious and nostalgic or whether you're writing a super important dissertation, right? Um, but I think it goes, goes beyond that because the question of the certain type of students that don't feel welcome in the institution and in the archive, that's one thing. And also the, all the outreach that goes around that, which I think, you know, it's one of the reasons why I said yes to being on this panel, why I start everything that I say with talking about the archives and what we have here and the kind of services that we do. And I think it's very important and happens a lot that people don't even know that we're here. Um, so one of the ways to do that is with faculty. So if faculty bring in their students and we're still, we're still doing virtual instruction, which is one of the ways and we can bring the, the archives to the students because something that happens with archives is you can't have a building, a build it and they will come mentality, right? You can't just digitize things and put them online and expect people to find them. You have to find these people that you think will benefit from your records and tell them, this is what we have. This is how you can use them. This is for you. So I think it's very important to have that kind of difference. It's not just them being accessible. It's more than that. 
Sarah, did you have other questions you wanted to ask? Um, I have a few questions, but I feel like they're all being answered in some way by what's being discussed, so it might be like uh, repetitive. Um, I had a question for Connie. Uh, um, it starts with like the idea, at least from when I first arrived at Pratt, there was this constant rhetoric of that students are overworked with studio. And so this idea that they're so overwhelmed with studio practices that there's a tension, a struggle or an apprehension to do anything that's outside of their classes. So that's either extracurricular activities or community organizing or being a part of a club. And so um, I was wondering the work that you did with the drum, like was this work that you did completely separate from your studio classes? And yeah. so, like, how did you establish this balance or this space and capacity to exist in both spaces? I didn't sleep much. Um, <laughs> well, I only did that, worked on that one issue of the drum. Okay. Um, and it was outside of my studio classes. And it, and it was enough work that I decided that I could not continue doing that without getting paid. I mean, that, that was my bottom line. And in fact, I had talked to Cosby, who was the um, art director and producing it, of ways in which we could support the drum, you know, get ads from local businesses and that kind of stuff. But some of the um, articles and things that were in it when I actually saw that issue I, could, I couldn't support it. There's an editorial in there where there's a lot of N-words and a whole lot of, it, it, it. I don't even know who wrote it. And I don't know what the point of it was, but I couldn't support it um, after that. And the fact that the, you know, the university owned it, I didn't want to put that kind of energy into something and not be able to get more out of it. But I think that's, you know, I have, and I think Pat has too, is when you can, you try to meld the two. If you have a, an assignment for a class that you can use somewhere else, or you do something somewhere else freelance that you can use for class, sometimes instructors will allow you to do that formally. Um, if you're working with an outside entity, but it is one of the issues. And, um, and particularly if you have to work, if you need to do work study, you need to do something else in order to maintain yourself, you may not have opportunities to, uh, or the time, the energy to do much extracurricular activities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We welcome anyone else in the audience if you'd like to ask questions to our panel and um, to type questions into the chat. We can also take another question from you, Sarah or Anisha, if you have any other questions. There's a question here that I could answer in the chat. Um, somebody asked, student publications seem to be a brilliant historical source. How has archival work changed to preserve current student publications? So mainly I'm doing two things, which is establish, it's the same Kind of the same approach that I have with BSU and with the Latinx Student Alliance that is establishing a relationship with these students and also with their faculty advisors if they have one, which is very important that um, we do have a steady like intake of things like the student newspaper, the Prattler and the Pertonia, which is the yearbook, but really it's not enough to just get the final product. Um, so the first thing that we that we've been doing um, and our guinea pigs for this have been the Pretonia, which is the yearbook, is that we're also um, um, collecting a bunch of their processing files. So we have photos of them. Um, we have their mockups. We have their presentation pitches and we have all of that. I think at Pratt is this is yearbooks doesn't sound like it's the most radical thing but at Pratt a lot of the yearbooks are really artist books and they denounce the institution and they talk about the state of the community some of the yearbooks include like the guys from the pizza place and from the art shop and like all those things so those so that's kind of the model that I'm trying to follow with others and right now we have for example ubiquitous is a literary publication at Pratt 
So we're also engaging with them. We have students from, from their group coming in to digitize materials so they can put them up in our digital collections, but also in their website. So that's kind of like the, the main approach is just building a relationship with them, but also not just focusing on the final product. Um, and, and also because we wound up, we wind up with a bunch of these like publications initiatives in the archives and we have no context for them. The only reason that I, that we, I could say that the drum was a self-described radical publication that focused on X and Y issues is because it said so in the newspaper. But if, we, <laughs> but if, we, <laughs> if you hadn't thought to add that in, we would never know unless somebody sits down and kind of analyzes. So, and that takes the work of another researcher. So it's not as easy as just sometimes a publication doesn't even have a date and we don't even know who That's made true. it. So, <laughs> yeah, so I'm trying to kind of combat that. Let me, let me ask you something. The Youth Service Coalition was um, another youth group that Horace Williams, the community liaison, started. This is a cover from a brochure. But I also fa found the um, paste up that I had done for it, if that is something you'd like to have in the archive, because I don't think students even remember about, know anything about how we used to paste stuff up. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So there's another question in the chat for everyone, um, which is, and how do we ensure that current students build upon what has come, gone before to give them more agency and power today? Hmm. That's a good question. I think, um, you know, just hearing from Christina at this point makes me feel like I could incorporate the archive some way in assignments going forward because just to familiarize students with it, the fact that it exists, I find it's so interesting, particularly now that I've started writing I, I, and digging into history. History is fascinating and there are stories and to incorporate them at some point in time, every class probably could work in some assignment that touched on the archives, the required using the archives in order to complete it, you know, just to make someone go over there and get familiar with it. Um, and it's all digital. You can, you can access everything digitally, right, Christina? Not everything. Not everything. Most, most of the materials that are digital are visual media. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, of course, we're digitizing on demand and students that are coming into campus and faculty and staff can request one-on-one -on -one appointments in the archives, so that that is still happening. It and we also like, have a fancy setup where I can show you materials from the archives live. Hello, okay. But also like if, if the archives needed any, I'm assuming you already do this, but if you needed anything graphic, you've got the whole communication designs department to lean on. Do you actually use students to produce any materials that you need? Maybe in the future, right now we haven't had that need, but in the future, yeah, I mean, if we if I was putting on an event and needed that, definitely I would tap students for that. Yeah, I could see I could see having an assignment that touched on the archives that required. Yeah, and we do students. we do get requests internal requests on the history of the logo and the history of the seal and things that have to do with the sign. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely be in touch with you, Christina, and okay. send over things. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's important to know that it's not just, it's, it, this is, our collecting focus is inward, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't go into other um, fields. It's not just about the history of Pratt. Through the history of Pratt, you can learn about the history of the neighborhood, about the history of art, about the history of design, about the history of feminism and the arts and a lot of different things. I can I see that in I all departments. Because I'm just saying with the architecture too, going back to that, the change in the neighborhood, the gentrification over the years, how it has changed so much, that should be recorded somewhere, you know? Um, yeah, I don't is, know I if mean, you have we, that. We even have the real estate ledger from when the Institute wow. was founded. So yeah. from, from the beginning. So it's actually super exciting to hear all of this because we're the project um, that we started this year one of the goals of this project is for it to continue to grow. We kind of think of it as like an ongoing series of conversations. And so this conversation that's happening today between alumni and faculty and current students and people from outside of the campus is one of the goals. And, and um, the idea of bringing more students into the archives and having the archive live on and tell the story is uh, very, very exciting that people are being inspired to do that. Um, we have one more question in the chat and then 
we're going to begin to wrap up. So um, here's a question for you, Connie and Pat. Um, you, thank you so much for giving so generously of your time to this project. And I suspect also as members of the Black Alumni of Pratt. So we're, the question is wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the Black Alumni Group and its activities, and if there's any connections that you might see to the Black Student Union and its goals. I'm not involved with it, so you have to ask Pat. <laughs> um, I do programs occasionally with the, uh, uh, with, uh, with the Black Alumni. I know that Dwight, when Dwight, um, I believe he started it, the Black Alumni Association. Yes. Yeah. And yes. um, he put so much energy into it and was so focused on trying to raise funds to help students who, because what would happen is, you know, students would come to campus and then not have enough money for supplies or whatever in order to complete their assignments. And so that I think was his initial focus, just to make sure that people had enough money to complete the semester or to get their supplies. Um, but it's just, it, it grew into quite a huge, you know, um, entity. Um, so my relationship with them is just to occasionally work with them on um, programs or to be supportive in any way that they need. If uh, Jelani calls me, I do whatever she tells me to do. Um, That's you know. hard to believe, Pat. <laughs> but, oh, no, I do. I do. I do. If she says do it, because, you know, they'll do things that, you know, they will have a scholarship um, competition or something like that, that um, I think all these things are always healthy, always good, always always keeping the students um, best interest and focus and so I, I try to be supportive of that and I think that there's groups all types of groups on the campus um, you know for all different uh, you know factors that, you know but for the black alumni I know they used to have these humongous um, benefits at the end of the year that uh, do I, I think they still do those and they would honor somebody in the arts and it was fabulous so um, like I said, my involvement with them is just to show up whenever Jelani says show up, do whatever panel she says do, work on whatever scholarship she says work on. Um, as far as I know, they're they're quite strong. They're going well. They're they're going, you know, nicely. It's it's grown into something quite substantial. And Thank there's you. a lot for everybody to be proud of. Thank you, Pat and Connie. Thank you, everyone who's been on this panel. We're gonna begin wrapping up. Um, it's such a pleasure and an honor to have you joining us today. Um, and we're going to start to wrap up. And I want to tell you a little bit about where we're going forward with this project. I wanted to say one thing um, quickly. Um, Pickett was involved with uh, Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation. Both Pat and I did work with them. I worked on staff there. And she did freelance work there. So, so much of what was said today um, is really about a kind of continuum. Something that Sarah, that you said in your presentation, when you were talking about how you feel like it's really important that current members of the BSU and of students at Pratt understand that there are people before them who have been active in this work and that there are going to be people after them who are hopefully also going to be active in this work. And that this is an ongoing dialogue in a way between alumni and current students between the past and the present. And Dean Harris and others in this presentation remarked on how this moment that we're living in is a very important moment. And it's one that has a lot to learn from and be informed by the people who were active in the past. Um, We've seen that very clearly. And so this project is producing some really amazing products. There's student work, there's research, there's a presentation such as this. But in addition to the products, we are seeing that what's also really valuable is the process, um, the ongoing iterative process between uh, conversations between different factions of the community, between people who are inside of Pratt and outside of Pratt, the building networks that are intergenerational, that are among different disciplines. Um, all of this is part of what we are valuing in this project and we're, we're so happy to be able to get to do this work. Um, additionally, we're beginning to move forward with the work into the spring. And actually one of um, our newest research assistant just joined us, Amber Cologne. 
And she is going to be continuing. She's a research fellow who is going to be specifically following up and doing more work with the Black Student Union and digging into the archives there. And so we're really excited to, to have that. We're also going to be offering the class again in the spring. And we are hoping to focus some of our research on the engineering school and the story of the closing of the engineering school. And so we're, we're one of the things that we're hoping is that people who are here today, that you continue to be involved with our work. And that that might mean that next time we present, if there's an exhibition or a panel discussion, that you come and that you participate. But it could be also that you, if you were a member of the Black Student Union, past or present, if you know anything about the engineering school or about the closing of the engineering school or involved, we'd love to meet you. Um, and at the very bottom of the screen, we encourage you to get in touch through Vicki Weiner, who is the head of the Historic Preservation Program, and her email address is here at the bottom. Pat, you mentioned that you know in your in your coursework you might start bringing people to the archives. We hope to encourage that other professors and faculty um, engage their students by bringing them to the archives and working with Christina. If you're interested in designing a course that you feel like could be a part of this project, we want to talk to you. Or if you're a faculty member or someone in the Pratt community who thinks that there are students that you know who would be interested in this work, let us know. There might be opportunities to do research. There might be opportunities to take a course. We want to um, encourage everyone. One of our goals is to encourage dialogue. And we, today was an example of that. And we want to continue that moving forward. So again, we want to extend a thank you to the provost office for the opportunity to do this work with the Strategic Initiative Funding Grant to the Graduate Center for Planning and the Environment's Earth Action Week for inviting us to present today. And I hope that all of you take advantage of some of the other opportunities for Earth Action Week. And thank you again, all of you who joined us today in the panel, Connie and Pat particularly, but everyone, and for all of you um, today, if there's anyone else on the panel who would like to have a few words before we close, I invite you to speak now um otherwise we will we'll wrap up i think we're good so thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon um and we look forward to seeing you hopefully in person one time it's eventually and and certainly virtually on campus um and again please do um uh, contact vicki weiner if you would like to participate with us and have a wonderful afternoon thank you